introduce our, our speaker, uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon. I've been practicing saying that for about a week now. Uh, uh, my French is horrible. Uh, and he's going to speak to, uh, uh, speak to us about what does it take to understand, looking for antidotes to fake news. Uh, president, uh, Professor Bourguignon has been president, or is president of the European Research Council. His training and background is in math, and he has a professor, professorship in France in math, as I understand it. Um, he, was, he was the director of IHES, which is the uh, French counterpart to the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. And he served as the leader and member of many French and European scientific committees. Personally, he's received awards for his work in France, uh, very, very many of them. He's a foreign member of the Spanish Academy of Sciences, the London Mathematical Society, founding member of Euroscience, um, and uh, honorary doctor at Keio University in Japan and Nakai University in China, um, and an honorary member of the German Association of Mathematicians. Uh, he's going to speak on the development of scientific knowledge and its relationship to fake news. Uh, which is uh, an extremely timely issue. Scientific knowledge, uh, is he, I think he's going to develop, is founded on elaborate concepts built over centuries and across diverse cultures. And to illustrate this, he's going to start by uh, discussing the number pi, the, the ratio of the circle to its circumference. Uh, and I, I was looking a little bit at this. There's Chinese, there's uh, Babylonian, there's Egyptian, Archimedes was uh, involved, uh, asked this question. In fact, uh, I think one version of it is called the Archimedes constant. In reference to the Dutch, there's Ludolf von Koehlen, I'm saying that wrong, uh, and it was a Ludolfian uh, number, which uh, he contri contributed, Newton and Euler. So it, it does have a long history. That's going to be one illustration. Another one will be the develop, uh, development of the notion of energy. Uh, which is another more physics uh, concept uh, that can have some relation to, for example, the discussion of global warming. And I think perhaps most closely to the issue of fake news, of uh, the development of vaccination, the anti-vaxxers, and confirma confirmation bias. So in all of this, what is the role of the scientific method? How will science help us to address the current scourge of fake news? And Professor Bourguignon will help us to understand this, how scientific knowledge uh, built in one area can be generalized. He will also, uh, also touch on uh, scientific knowledge from new technical tools. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here at NTU. I would say one more time, but uh, it's always a pleasure to see how the university develops. and. Uh, and really creates new institutes, like the one that, which has been inaugurated yesterday, which I think is a very interesting venture at the cross line between many different uh, activities. I mean, uh, social science, humanities, of course, but uh, also, uh, of course, science uh, altogether. So the topic, as you've uh, heard, is uh, definitely um, what it takes to understand, because uh, very often one takes this for, for granted. So. I must say that uh, one of the reasons why I took a historical perspective is that uh, really to try and understand the world around us has been a permanent endeavor of mankind. It has been actually also a fantastic driver for developing science. And it often took great minds to get sufficient distance from the most immediate apprehension one can develop and to offer a radically different vision of a phenomenon and most of the time, a controversial one when it f was first formulated. It is, uh, however, vital to state upfront how much science is a collective enterprise with a multitude of contributors and transmitters. So this is one thing I want to illustrate in this lecture. So the purpose of this lecture is really to have a look at this process, to recognize its uh, complexity, but also to explore how it had been nurtured, but also perverted. Indeed, the process by which knowledge about natural phenomenon has been built over centuries and across cultures requires, most of the time, many steps and a permanent check, taking note of the development of new instruments and the availability of new information. At any given moment, an underestimated step 
easy elaboration of concepts that more often than not requires many attempts before being firmly established and accepted. They provide the framework for thinking, and without a framework, it is just impossible to understand. They are rarely isolated from a global vision of the world, and hence are part of the culture in which one's life is embedded. Recognizing the richness of different approaches whilst creating the proper tool to make them compatible and understandable is one of the challenges mankind has faced and continues to face. In order to make this fundamentally philosophical discussion more accessible, I propose to explore three examples of this process and to confront them with the ways they have disseminated in society and also challenged. In our information age, where news spread instantaneously and ignore borders, these challenges have taken a new dimension. This is the context in which fake news or disinformation have become a major problem. The issue has reached the point of becoming a threat to the development of an informed society. Indeed, whilst the widespread availability of internet allows many more people to take part in the exchange, it also offers new possibilities for action to people who have an interest in manipulating the discussion. This is why having some solid methodological references at one's disposal is fundamental. Schools are the natural environment to equip every citizen of the world with such tools. More precisely, widespread quality education is critical for long-term sustainable development of the world. Discussing some issues in relation to measures that can be taken to win the ongoing battle against fake news will be a significant part of the conclusions of this lecture. As was said, the three examples I chose because of their very diverse natures are, number one, the measure of the circumference of a circle and the number pi. Second one is the concept of energy and its use in society. And the third one is vaccination, success, and challenges. As you easily see, they resonate with different parts of science, and their history, as well as their impact on society, have taken quite specific paths and have become universal in the end. Showing the variety of settings for the development of knowledge is also one of the objectives of this lecture. To get the process going, it is indeed indispensable to recognize this variety and the possibility for many actors in various positions to contribute. Along the way, we will see how knowledge built in one area turns out to be pertinent in other areas in a process that is most of the time totally unexpected. We will also show new knowledge, how, um, we'll also show how new knowledge can come from the availability of new technical tools, showing the linkage between the abstract and the concrete. So let me start with a consideration about circle and number pi. The question of evaluating the perimeter of a circle has been considered by many different societies going back far back in history. The circle is such a natural figure, having very attractive features. From a strictly material point of view, a stone sculptures a cylinder with a circular basis is the easiest object that one can move around, as one only needs to push it and uh, to have it roll. To bring it back to our subject, the first question is, what does it mean to measure? It necessarily amounts to comparing different lengths. In the case in question, still the answer is not so simple. How can one compare the lengths of an intrinsically bent object with that of straight ones? Solution can be to roll the circle on the surface and measure the distance covered when the marked point on the circle comes back in contact with the surface on which it rolls. Very early on, it was noticed that the value found for the ratio between the perimeter of a circle and its diameter was slightly over three. A whole number like three is understood everywhere as integers are accessible in almost all societies. To come up with this notion, one only has to repeat using a unit. To say more, one needs to have a more sophisticated notion of numbers than just natural numbers. More than 3,500 years ago, one finds a Babylonian tablet proposing 28 
divided by 8, 28, 8, that is 3.125 in our decimal notation, as an estimate for the ratio between the perimeter of the circle and its diameter. Babylonians used the decimal system with basis 60, and to get this value, they needed two terms after the integral part in this system. The famous Rin papyrus found in Luxor in the mid-19th century contains a value for pi, which amounts to 256 divided by 81. 3.1604, again in our decimal notation. Egyptian seems to have understood that for a circle, the ratio between the perimeter and the diameter on one hand, diameter being twice the radius, and that between the area and the square of the radius was the same number pi. Now comes the natural question of the mathematical nature of the number pi. It appeared explicitly in Greece some 2,500 years ago, with a refinement due to Euclid two centuries later, in the form of whether it is possible to square a circle. What does that mean? This means constructing a square of the same area as a circle using only a ruler and a compass. Many solutions have been proposed, all incorrect, until it was proven in 1882 by Lindemann that pi is not an algebraic number, that is a solution of a polynomial equation with integral coefficient, a fortiori not a number constructible from the unit one by ruler and compass that lead necessarily to a very special algebraic number. So this fantastic achievement, namely to prove that one cannot square a circle, relied on the fact that pi could be made appear in many other instances in mathematics. This includes the repartition of prime numbers, something that doesn't seem to have anything to do with measuring the perimeter of a circle. Note that the Swiss mathematician, Johann Lambert, proved in 1761 that pi is an irrational number, that is, cannot be expressed as a fraction. But I don't want to go further in this direction. Still, I want to recall the incredible progress made over centuries to get a more accurate value for pi. A lot of them were obtained by more and more precise approximations. Both the circumference and the area, the idea is very simple, namely to replace the circle by regular polygons inscribed in the circle or tangent to it with more and more sides. Of course, to achieve the calculations requires a lot of work and some in-depth knowledge about the geometry of the elementary triangles forming the polygon. In this context, it is appropriate to mention the name, the contribution of Archimedes, who in his essay on the measure of the circle, proved rigorously that indeed pi is a number appearing both in evaluating the perimeter and the area of the circle. He also established that pi lies as a number between 223 divided by 71, which in decimal notation is 3.1408, and 22 divided by 7, which is 3.1429. And getting the value 3.14 that is taught in all schools around the world today. This is why the day after tomorrow, the 14th of March, is called Pi Day, it's 3.14. Further contributions were brought by Aryabhata in India, also by Tzu Chongqi in China, who approximately 15 100 years ago, proposed a remarkable value, 355 divided by 113, which is 3.1415 proving providing six correct decimals. I gave eight decimals to show that you know a very interesting property of fractions, of, which is uh, rational numbers, if you prefer, which is the fact that uh, if you divide two integers, one by the other, in decimal writing, of course, you get a repetition appearing. And uh, in this case, it was 92. Another fantastic performance was achieved in 1429 by the Persian mathematician Al-Kashi, who provided 14 decimals correct. Science came back to the Western world approximately at this time with contribution of Nicola Viet some 400 years ago, who proposed the first exact formula for pi as the limit of a sequence of fractions involving iterated radicals containing only a square root of two. 
But it seems that the first formula expressing pi as the sum of a series inspired by analysis, the part of mathematics dealing with limits and series, and not geometry, came from India. Indeed, a little over 700 years ago, first Madhava of Sangha gave a formula for pi as a limit of an infinite sequence. And then some 500 years ago, Nilakanta Somayayi obtained a formula involving only explicit rational numbers converging much more quickly than previous ones. To get n correct decimals for pi, one had only to look at the 2n term of the series. It is in 1705 that 100 correct decimals for pi were obtained by John Machin. And shortly after, the Welsh mathematician William Jones started to use the symbol pi for a number. Not so long ago. I can close this section without mentioning the great formula for pi squared, that is pi multiplied by pi, obtained by the Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler. Pi squared is six times the sum of the inverse of the integers squared. Bringing up again the obsessive question, how does this relate to the perimeter of the circle? This odyssey about pi shows how, over centuries, the concept of numbers has enriched itself, how the power of mathematicians has grown to go in depth into the structure of numbers. Of course, the race for decimals of pi has been transformed in the days of powerful computers, who are presently beyond billions of decimals. There is one more aspect I want to touch upon here, in some sense related to fake news. The Bible contains an episode where the value taken for pi is 3. The number is not given much attention, actually. But in 1897, a strange event happened in the General Assembly of Indiana in the US. One of the lawmakers introduced a bill supposed to offer, I quote, a new mathematical truth for free use in the state. Actually, it was related to a necessarily failed attempt to square the circle. After being approved unanimously by this assembly, the bill was stopped in the Senate of the state of Indiana, thanks to the presence on that very day, where it was supposed to be discussed, of a Purdue mathematics professor, who immediately stopped the inappropriateness of such a bill. This shows the need not only to observe the separation of power, judiciary, legislative, executive, introduced by Montesquieu in order to preserve democracy, but also to make sure that the pursuit of truth by scientists is not distorted by political attempts to establish a new type of truth. As a revenge, in 2009, the US House of Representatives passed a bill that, I'm quoting, supports the designation of Pi Day and its celebration around the world and encourages schools and educators to observe the day with appropriate activities that teach students about pi and engage them about the study of mathematics. So I'm moving to my second example. I hope you have not been too bored by mathematics. The second example is quite different in nature, as it concerns a concept, namely energy, that took a long time to emerge, in, um, to emerge although it is now completely central in physics and its society at large. There are deep reasons for this, the slowness of the process. It indeed required that one realizes that different phenomena were actually several facets of the same coin. For this example, too, let us take a historical perspective. This is strongly suggested by the historian of science, Robert Lindsay, speaking about the concept of energy. I'm quoting. One cannot hope really to understand its present state or its future implications without some appreciation of this history." End of quote. The word energy appears in Aristotle to express, I'm quoting, what makes matter move or take form. The struggle to explain the cause of movement lasted several centuries, and several quantities were considered in order to achieve that. The product of the mass by the speed, coined quantity of motion by René Descartes, was one of them. The living force was another one introduced by Galileo Galilei, the conservation of which was established for the collision of elastic bodies by Christian Huygens, Dutch. A long-lasting controversy on the living force initiated by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz 
extended over a century. Even the introduction of the fundamental law of mechanics by Isaac Newton in the late 17th century, relating the force to be applied to the acceleration uh, of the movement of point masses, didn't fully clarify the situation for the, the motion of more complex media, such as fluids, for example. This is to say that even in the limited context of mechanics, the identification of the key concept took a lot of efforts and some false steps. Although some attempts of developing steam machine can be traced back to 2,000 years ago, it is the 18th century that saw the development of steam machines as a at a visible scale. This prompted, in particular, James Watt to establish some kind of correspondence between heat and the movement produced. This was done in a somewhat systematic way for the first time by Julius Robert von Meyer in the early 19th century, who considered both the production of heat by movement and the converse. This was taken to a new level of rigor by Jem Prescott Joule in the mid 19th century. He clearly established an equivalence between mechanical work, which is the product of the force applied with the displacement, and heat. He actually considered various forms of energy, mechanical work, heat, chemical energy, electric and magnetic versions of energy. This led him to state that heat is not a substance, as was defended by some earlier, but related to motion. This gave a major blow to the so-called caloric theory, introduced in particular by Sadi Carnot, that had been prevailing for some decades. It is interesting to note that for James Joule, science was mainly a hobby as he was managing the family brewery. It is now clear that heat is indeed a measure of the intensity of the erratic motion of molecules in a medium, and that the theory of thermodynamics, a major achievement of the 19th century, could be connected to a macroscopic description of matter. Of fundamental importance to present-day science is the conservation of energy that requires that energy be given a precise definition valid in its various forms. One can view this principle, I'm quoting, as Richard Feynman calls it, a quantitative version of the statement that energy is transformed from one form to another without being created or destroyed. This versatility is precisely what makes its identification such a challenging task but also why it is a backbone of present-day physics and more generally science, as the concept has spread to all natural sciences. In 1905, another barrier was crossed by Albert Einstein when he developed the theory of special relativity and established his famous formula E equals mc squared, where E stands for energy, m the mass transformed, and c the speed of light. This shows that mass is a form of energy. This was the basis for looking at nuclear reactions when mass is transformed into energy as possible sources of energy, and because of the value of the speed of light, enormous quantities of energy. This can, make the form, this can take the form of fission, the spontaneous decomposition of some heavy radioactive atoms, or fusion, the combination of light atoms, such as deuterium, into heavier ones. The key issue for this reaction is to control them. For the fusion, this is precisely what happens in nuclear power plants. This has not yet been achieved for fusion. When discussing energy issues, depending on the scale one is considering, many different units are used. The official one, adopted in the système international, is the joule. But we all have heard of calories of kilowatt hour of gigawatt year, typically to discuss power plants. But also, electron volt, when one discusses phenomena at the atomic scale. The previous discussion clearly touched on the fact that energy has not only remained an object of interest for laboratories, but has taken a dimension relevant for industry. Steam engines have been key for the development of a number of activities in factories, but also, of course, of trains. This installation of electric grids in providing to houses and factories an easy way to use energy source made it a key factor for the development of modern societies. Exploring new energy sources has become a major and urgent challenge as threats to the climate appeared. They are due in particular to the massive production of carbon dioxide, 
by trucks, cars, power plants using fuel to produce electricity. This is where we are brought back to the issue of fake news. This is not surprising because of the generalized use of energy sources by the population. Any change in this respect has necessarily a massive impact on the functioning of society and affects a number of economic actors. Of course, I could go into the issue of climate change and the many attempts to challenge the need to take measures to diminish drastically the production of carbon dioxide in the coming years by climate change skeptics. I will rather focus on the considerable difference between energy production and energy usage. As a customer, one's request is that energy be available when one needs it. Depending on the source producing the energy, its availability at the given time may vary considerably. Renewable sources such as solar or windmills are clearly intermittent and not so regular. The main issue here is that the capacity to store energy is very far from the variations of energy demand. This has a great impact on which energy mix can be safely proposed and planned. The public discussion on energy issues focuses much too often on what percentage of the energy produced comes from this or that source and not on the real problem, which is a response to the customer's demands. On top of that, some sources have definite location. Think of hydroelectric generators or wind farms implanted in the sea. This makes the use of energy transport a very important one, although in terms of the investments that it requires. This part of the problem, too, is most of the time not properly presented. Currently, they are, these, are, these are challenges Germany faces in the implementation of its strategy to close down all its nuclear power plants by 2022. To achieve this, it relies on importing electricity from neighboring countries, France with its still massive nuclear production of electricity, or Czech Republic or Poland are still heavy producer of carbon dioxide. Of course, some advocacy groups with explicit economic interest in not changing the present policy invest in order to influence the public debate whilst hiding some issues. The problem is actually deeper. Clearly, the issue of the energy policy is a complex one, ranging from truly technical questions, both on the production and distribution sides, long-term investments, to potential new possibilities that may appear from disruptive innovations. It is therefore very difficult for a person who is not informed in detail of the problems to speak authoritatively on such an issue. The only positive way out is that people in charge take pains to inform about the various dimensions of the problem, about the new possibilities and propose various scenarios highlighting the advantages and drawbacks. This can only be done through a close association between experts and non-experts who can identify possible misunderstandings and ambiguities in the communication to a wider audience. Communication between experts is a very coded exercise most of the time. The lack of solid analysis can also be pointed out in reports by some governmental organizations. By way of example, the French Académie des Technologies just issued a very critical note about the scenarios for the electric mix for the period 2020 to 2060, produced by the French Agence de l'Environnement et de la Maîtrise de l'Énergie. This emphasizes how important it is on global issues such as this one for expert groups to have the possibility to give an independent view on official communications. At the European level, such a group of, quote, chief scientific advisors has been established with the duty of studying issues submitted to it or most importantly, that it chose to consider using a self-referral procedure. I'm coming to my third example. Biology and medicine are probably the two domains where the evolution of the level of understanding has changed most considerably in the last 200 years. Think of the concept of bacteria. It is only in the 18th century that Lazzaro Spallanzani, a biologist and a clerk, could establish that microorganisms could be cultivated in meat juice. He noted that the culture didn't work if the meat juice had been overheated and kept away from hair. He was one of the first to develop an experimental approach to biology. His discoveries gave a very significant blow to the then prevailing theory of, quote, spontaneous generation. 
Still, this discovery remained a curiosity for some time without the understanding of the possible role of bacteria in illnesses, as well as in some economic processes such as fermentation. In this context, the first work directly related to microorganism were done in mid 19th century by Casimir Daven. He proved that the sheep anthrax is due to a bacteria and can be transmitted in a controlled way. In the same period, Robert Koch, a German medical doctor, could go one step further and show, using images under a microscope, how the bacillus for anthrax can transform itself to resist in the ground and affect some more animals. He developed a methodology for microbiology. He's famous for having discovered the bacillus for tuberculosis and for cholera. Louis Pasteur was a French chemist who was very interested in fermentations, in particular in relation to breweries. He believed that some contagious illnesses could be caused by microorganisms. Responding to a request by the Ministry of Agriculture, he studied an illness that was spreading among silkworms, creating serious economic damage. This led him to identify a number of bacteria causing various kinds of illnesses. While working on the hand cholera, he noticed that animals can be protected if one injects an age preparation of the microbe to them. This reminded him of the work of Edward Jenner about one century earlier, who, through injections of vaccine, a benign version of the smallpox for cows, in cows, protected humans against smallpox, a major health hazard at the time. Since antiquity, it had been known that somebody exposed to the illness will not contract it again. In fact, some 1,000 years ago, Chinese had developed a primitive form of vaccine to prevent smallpox called variolation in the form of an exposition to tissues from people who had suffered from smallpox. This practice spread from Asia to some countries. This led the wife of the ambassador of England to Turkey, who survived the two smallpox, though severely affected, to spread the practice beginning with her own children. This is reported by Voltaire in his letters on the English, where he advocated for the spread of the practice in the whole of France, based on its success for centuries in China and in some Asian countries. In the middle of the 19th century, vaccination was adopted in England over variolation because it was much safer. Louis Pasteur led a spectacular demonstration to vaccinate a group of animals against anthrax, leaving a control group unvaccinated. All animals that had been inoculated survived, whilst almost all the others died. Getting to vaccinate humans against diseases that were not well understood was a step that it took only facing the absolute emergency of a child risking rabies. The attempt was successful, giving visibility to the practice. Vaccines against many other diseases caused by bacteria or viruses have been developed during the 20th century. Measles, polio, diphtheria, tuberculosis, tetanus. In 1980, it was established that smallpox had been eradicated from the surface of Earth. In view of the death toll of this illness on humans over centuries, this was an amazing achievement of medicine through meticulous, widespread, and obligatory vaccination campaigns. The same is true for polio 20 years later for the Americas and Europe. Measles was also declare, declared eliminated in the United States in 2000. In order to better understand, it, it is important to ask how vaccination works. The immune system of a living organism remembers attacks it has been exposed to. They prompt it to develop some defense. In case of a renewed attack, it will be much faster to identify the signature of the illness and respond to it more efficiently. The idea that Louis Pasteur had of the reason why the aging of the pathogen would be sufficient to create such a moderate reaction to the illness was actually erroneous. He indeed believed that the next generations of the microbe had become tame due to interaction with the environment when this property was in reality random, hence the cause of potential accidents. This scheme was in line with Pasteur's adherence to the theory of Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck where today Darwinian evolution is accepted as the right model. We now know that the vaccination led to the production of antibodies 
protecting the living organism from all microbes having the same molecular structure. Of course, vaccines against rabies are obtained today, particularly by the Pasteur Institute, through genetic manipulation, which is a much safer way to produce vaccines. So far, I spoke only about the individual level. It is critical to also speak about the collective dimension. That is the fact that if people don't get affected by a microbe or a virus, they will not spread them in their active form. Depending on the speed of propagation of a given germ, there are different thresholds for the portion of the population which needs to be vaccinated in order to protect the whole population. In the case of measles, for example, which is a very contagious illness, this threshold is about 95%. We are presently facing a situation where, after a drop in the percentage of children of a given generation vaccinated against measles, very serious outbreaks of the illness appear in many countries, France in particular. For Europe, more than 60,000 cases in 2018, more than twice the number in 20, 2017, with the death toll at 72, also double that of 2017. Vaccinated against measles is clearly a collective responsibility for the very reason just explained. The drop in the level of vaccination has been followed by a significant increase in cases of the illness. It is almost surely the result of an anti-vaccine movement that started from an erroneous piece of news claiming a link between vaccination and the spread of autism. Such a link has been repeatedly disproved by a number of studies done in several countries. Still, a number of populist parties joining some religious groups which refuse human interventions on the human body nurture the anti-establishment message with such disinformation. A corruption dimension has been added with a claim made that the opinions of medical doctors are biased through subsidies they are supposed to receive from pharmaceutical companies selling vaccines. The accusation can reach the level of a conspiracy claiming that these companies spread microbes and viruses to sell more of their products. The route for such a campaign is, of course, much broader than the vaccination issue. It has to do with a claim for more freedom vis-a-vis -vis the state. That is the freedom for parents to decide whether their children should be vaccinated or not. As explained before, such a freedom, in the end, affects the freedom of others as lowering the vaccination rate as potentially an effect on everybody. It is also connected with mistrust towards the elite and experts. Indeed, indeed, regarding this issue in order to monitor the situation, there is no other way but collecting data and comparing them to data collected in the past to see whether there is an evolution. This leaves again room to accuse the state for manipulating data to make them consistent with the policy it defends. Still, one must ask oneself why fantasies of that sort can find such an echo. The answer may be simple. In times where a poignant testimony weighs much more than a rational argument, a crying mother deploring the death of her child, supposedly a victim of a vaccine, will always win against well-documented statistics, even when they establish that vaccination prevents two to four million deaths each year, as estimated by the World Health Organization. The problem requires permanent attention, as every new piece of science that can be relevant for the issue becomes misrepresented. The new scientific understanding of the role of microbes in the body has been recently used to give a new line of arguments according to which vaccine would be unnecessary, or even worse, that they interfere negatively with the human immune system. Dr. Stefan Guttinger, a biochemist now working at the London School of Economics, who studied these arguments with the support of the European Research Council, the European Research Program of the honor of chairing, concludes, to counter the propaganda by anti-vaccine activists, the research and public health communities have to adjust their communication, arguing that vaccines are safe and the most efficient public health intervention to combat infectious disease is no longer just a question of providing more data on the safety of specific vaccine. It has to expand to discuss a broader view of human biology, the body's microbiomes and their role in health and disease to reassert that while not all bugs are bad, some are. And vaccines help to protect us against these. The fight for, end of quote, the fight for a better and deeper understanding is clearly called for, for 
to attempt to get out of the vicious circle. I'm coming to my conclusion. As usual, when one wants to deal with a problem, it is critical to consider its origin, short-term fixes, and long-term measures that could tackle it properly. When it comes to, take, to fake news, we must first acknowledge that the problem is not a new one. One finds wrong information and rumors all along human history. Some were just negligence. Others were deliberate attempts to manipulate people and became systematic propaganda tools. Of course, as mentioned in the introduction, when the easy accessibility and instantaneity of the internet, the problem has reached another scale. Almost everyone is confronted with a deluge of information, and to deal with it properly requires a lot of energy and also some method. The most comfortable attitude is, unfortunately, to give priority to any information that supports what one really thinks, already thinks, about a given subject. The result is exactly the opposite of the dream that some of the creators of internet had, namely to give rise to a connected world where people can share opinions. It leads to a more fragmented world where discussing in-depth rational arguments seldomly takes place. It also offers to people who have the means and the knowledge to manipulate information to intervene in a number of issues having an impact on society at large, political, societal, in the end, creating the risk of changing the course of history, a risk that has never been higher than today. The focus of the lecture was on the scientific side of the problem, namely to confront how scientific concepts and facts are established, consolidated, and sometimes contested, along with their use in the society at large. This touches a very specific domain where fake news have indeed played a significant role. I want to quote here Professor Jason Heifler, whose project has been supported by the European Research Council. I'm quoting, while some people may simply lack relevant factual knowledge, others may actively hold incorrect beliefs. This project is principally, that's the description of his project, is principally about misperceptions, the facts that people believe that, that simply are not true. What misperceptions do Europeans hold on issues like immigration, vaccines, and climate change? Who holds these mis misperceptions? What demographic and attitude variables are correlated with holding misperceptions? And ultimately, what can be done to help reduce misperception? Misperception, I'm continue to quote, misperceptions are an important topic for study because they distort public preferences and outcomes. The results of studies presently available are uniformly troubling. Among those vulnerable to holding a given misperception, corrective efforts often make misperceptions worse or decrease the likelihood to engage in desired behavior. I'm still quoting, this ambitious project, said he's describing his project, has three primary objectives to assess levels of misperceptions in Europe on three specific issues, immigration, vaccines, and climate change, that represent three different substantive domains of knowledge, politics, health, and science, to examine, to examine the variety of approaches and techniques for combating misperceptions and generating effective corrections. Last, to transmit the findings back to relevant academic and policymaker audiences in order to aid policy designs and communication efforts on important policy issues. End of quote. As you can imagine, I'm thrilled to see how this research develops, as I'm very interested in knowing some short-term fixes. Another contribution towards short-term solution can come from institutions. From this point of view, the European Commission has taken a number of steps to better understand the situation and to tackle the matter. I want in particular to point to the digital economy working paper produced by the Joint Research Center, which is a research center of the, uh, funded by the European Commission, entitled The Digital Transformation of News Media and the Rise of Disinformation and Fake News, published last year. Another piece of a similar nature is a communication to all European official bodies entitled, I'm quoting, tackling online disinformation, a European approach. Just about a month ago, the European Commission issued a press release about the code of practice against this disinformation in which, after publishing the first report submitted by the signatories, including Google and Facebook, of a code of practice against disinformation signed last year. 
Whilst the Commission welcomed the progress made, such as the removal of fake news accounts, it also, and I'm quoting, called on signatories of the Code of Practice to intensify the efforts in the run-up to the 2019 European Union elections. These are some of the efforts made at the European Union level. The only long-term fix is widespread education of better quality, in particular what, for what entails the understanding of science, how it developed, and how it functions. A number of countries have developed major efforts to make sure that the nature of science is properly presented to children. Indeed, science is built on observations made possible by the development of ingenious tools and intricate interaction with sometimes counterintuitive theories. Scientists have to be open-minded enough to allow observations to change their minds. And these observations can serve as the basis for others to go further by pure creative thinking. All this very much resonates with the thinking of the European Research Council as we try to help scientists thrive where they are from, providing them with the means, the trust, and the freedom to search for truth and pursue their scientific curiosity. On the basis of knowledge developed in many different cultures, it took centuries to arrive at a method of its own, the scientific method. Earlier approaches based on deduction by which analysis of known facts produced, produced further in understanding was replaced by induction, that is to abandon the assumption and to attempt to observe with an open mind. Francis Bacon played a major part in establishing and popularizing this theoretical framework for science and many of these concepts are considered part of proper methodology today. The French astronomer André Braic phrased it beautifully, I'm quoting, to understand the scientific method, one has to realize that progress comes from a continuous process of calling into question. A proposition is only scientific if it is falsifiable, in other words, if anyone can verify it or invalidate it. End of quote. This is why, I'm quoting again, the history of scientific ideas is an excellent school of doubt, humility, rigor, honesty, and the critical spirit, which are prime virtues in the service of a passion for knowledge. End of quote. We need children from all over the world to be exposed in an active way to such a methodology early on to get vaccinated against fake news. The aim should also be to trigger the imagination and enthusiasm to be part of the global enterprise. Science is to improve the world. We live in a better world place where the pursuit of knowledge is respected and cherished. Thank you for your attention. I think we have some time for questions. Uh, so anyone who wishes to ask a question? Thank you for this very comprehensive overview of, uh, of uh, actually quite a few sciences. It was very fascinating. Thank you. Uh, as I was listening uh, to your talk, I couldn't help thinking about the social aspects of this problem. So, um, for instance, uh, I, I will quote the famous words of uh, Kim Kardashian, where she said, I know it is true because I feel it is true. And uh, you also mentioned the, the belief that people have this belief and what influences their belief. And, and probably social relationships are very influential. I mean, it, it makes, a, makes a big difference to me if the, I don't know, if there is a poster from the government telling me to do something or when Brad Pitt comes on TV and tells me to do something. I might listen a little more. Um, so the, this, this aspect of social relationships, the, the strong ties, but also the weak ties that you have with famous people or role models. And role models are so different from for different strata in civilization. Uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be very interested to know your thoughts about whether you think that could, could be part of the solution, part of the solution of reaching people, rather than, you know, us scientists telling people, well, you know, vaccinations really work, we know that they work, and people just don't feel that it's true. They need to feel it because of some social influence. Is, is, is that a reasonable assumption? I think you're certainly correct. The, the, the difficulty with addressing this, of course, is the variety of situations of uh, these social relations is immense. Uh, actually, one of my motivation in uh, using vaccination in my lecture comes from my daughter. She's a medical doctor, 
and uh, she uh, has been exposed to really situation of parents uh, refusing to vaccinate their children. And then up to the point that she was really pressing them and she lost them as patients. They just went away, which showed that in this case, the social relation was broken and maybe she did not do it right, I don't know. But, uh, but for her, it, uh, it's becoming a very serious issue, in particular France, for which measles was really completely under control and it's not anymore under control, just because, uh, as I mentioned to you, in the case of measles, the threshold is very high, it's 95%. So you don't need the really so many people not vaccinated to really have the illness uh, appearing again. So, of course, there are many different situations. Of course, the, the, the case of schools is also in terms of social relation. It depends very much in which country you are living. I mean, uh, in many countries, I mean, really, the teacher is the teacher and the pupils are the pupils. And uh, in some other countries, uh, the relation between the pupils and teacher is quite a different one. It's much more open and with the possibility of being critical. And uh, if I look back at my own uh, history, Actually, the, the, the moment I decided, for example, to become a mathematician and not a writer or a philosopher, which I wanted to be, uh, was exactly when in front of me I had somebody I couldn't understand. So I had a relation with him. Uh, I mean, he was a teacher. He should really be able to teach me something I understand. But at the same time, in a sense, his passion or his... Uh, way of talking about mathematics were, was so convincing, even I couldn't understand what he was saying, that it became for me uh, motivation. And that's the way I learned to work by myself and finally understand what he was saying. He was not saying it very well, but for sure it was very interesting. And this is the way I became a mathematician. So you see these two examples show that it, depending on how you relate to people, is, uh, is, is a great important. Of course, the, the teacher I had before, because I had for many years the same teacher, was a fantastic teacher. But in a sense, it never generated in me interest because it was so easy. So well, you do it. But I mean, all young children, they want to be challenged. I mean, they, they look for challenges. They don't look for easy things. So of course, I was successful in doing math, but I was not interested. So I think your point is very correct. So, but then you have to model very different situations where people are either in some kind of a well, like top-down relation or much more equal relation. And uh, a number of efforts have been made in a number of countries now for the teaching of science to really have the young people much more personally engaged in practicing science rather than learning science, in particular mathematics, as something you learn by heart and that's it which of course then you miss the whole point because mathematics is not supposed to be learned by heart, it's supposed to be understood. And so if you don't get the opportunity to be exposed to this dimension, then you miss something. So you certainly are completely correct. The difficulty is that I think you would have to probably propose a certain number of uh, typical models and then to see how in these models you, you can <coughs> develop uh, a relation which leads to really an improvement in the understanding Uh, Jean-Pierre, after I would like to have a copy of your presentation Thank because you. it was uh, scientific. But uh, by the way, just on the not on the serious side, it's the first time I see a mathematician presenting without slides. <laughs> <laughs> well, so well done. Because I'm, maybe I'm not a true mathematician. mathematician. <laughs> I should be a philosopher. But. You changed the profession. But just on the serious side, uh, what is the strongest antidote you found against the fake news? What is the strongest? the strongest antidote? Well, as I said, I mean, there are different dimensions. I mean, uh, one dimension, the, the, I mean, as I said, short-term fix. So maybe part of it can be regulations, which uh, is typically what has been done with closing down some, uh, some um, uh, I mean, uh, sources of fake news, because, I mean, definitely they are, I mean, creating uh, bad things. But as I said, for me, the only long-term fix is really having a better educated population. And of course, it's a very slow process. It's an expensive process. You need good teachers. You have to give a lot of respect to the teachers, maybe to pay them a little better. It depends on the countries. I think Singapore is paying its teachers quite reasonably well. It's not the case in all countries, I can tell you. And, and so I think, uh, and of course, you have to find something in between because you, so how, for me, maybe the worst situation, the worst part of this present situation is this fragmentation which has happened. The people are, there's a deluge of information. So how do you resist to that? Well, by selecting things which say things you already feel comfortable with. And therefore, you're creating some kind of very close system. 
And uh, how do you provoke people to accept to be challenged? Actually, one thing uh, maybe I can mention to you, and my assistant knows that very well. At some point in my life, I was the president of the ethics committee of CNRS. And uh, one thing which uh, resulted in that, I was attacked by a number of extreme right and extreme left group because they were pretending some that we were not doing what we are supposed to do, and some others that we are not uh, really uh, so having some kind of not uh, form, uh, really very strict form. And then so I, I got these messages. And rather than cutting this, I still keep getting in my mail the, the information from these uh, extreme groups. And for me, it's always very interesting. Of course, I feel sometimes completely flabbergasted what I read. But it's extremely important to know what people you really uh, are fearing, what they are going to do, are really claiming. Because then you have some chance of uh, saying, OK, well, how can one say such a thing? I mean, and then you start to really wonder how you can I have no solution to address that, but I think keeping an open mind, which means being exposed to extreme opinions, even if you don't share them, is extremely important. Because then that's the only way you can understand that things can transform themselves in ways that you don't like. And I'm afraid at this moment, this is really something which um, I don't see how to do it. That is that people accept to be much more, more open, to be confronted with the opposite opinions. Uh, because the debate tends to be, in particular, one dimension of debate. In order to have such a debate, you need to respect people. So as soon as, the, instead of exchanging with people, you insult them, this is gone. I mean, uh, insult is never going to uh, allow an exchange. So, and I must say that in recent years, I mean, quite not so many years, really the discourse, in particular the political discourse, has become very, very aggressive, very, very strong. And this is not uh, the good way of moving forward. And so I'm just uh, seeing this. I have no way of changing it. But for me, it's a very serious concern. That's why recent evolution in many different countries, as, um, uh, I, I see this as a very global phenomenon. So it must have to do with very, very uh, explicit changes in the technology and the use of technology by people. Because it's happening in many countries in different disguises, but it's the same phenomenon. So I think one needs to understand that better. And um, I'm not sure that enough attention has been paid to that, enough studies have been conducted. That's why I quoted this uh, ERC uh, projects, because I like that some people just spontaneously, that was, we are a completely bottom-up system, suggested to look into these matters and to analyze them in a scientific way. Because I think we need much more in-depth uh, analysis of the situation to really be able to come up with uh, solutions. And for the moment, uh, I think it's very important to identify the problem, and then maybe we, we can find solutions. Yeah, thank you for your very enlightening lecture. I'm happy that you started with the concept of pie, because now the, there's even people questioning that the, the, the Earth is a globe. <laughs> Yeah, no, sure, there is a society it's for flat earth, exactly. which exists, yeah. So that, that is really Everything stunning is stunning to me that things that have been established for hundreds, if not thousands of years, are now being questioned so fundamentally. It's like denying reality. So my question, actually, the, the thought experiment that's been going on in my mind is, uh, she mentioned about the social aspect. What about the economic aspect? Because what we've seen in the last 30 to 40 years is... Uh, increase in the income disparity, the Gini coefficient has been going up the roof. Um, basically, the benefits of science have not trickled down to the lower strata. I, I, that, that's the thought experiment going on in my head. And this, this leads to a distrust of science. So I don't want to hear all your reason about vaccine, all the experiments you did. I just don't believe you. And I'm glad you shared your experience of your daughter where the, the patient just disengaged. So. And when you mentioned that education plays an important role, I absolutely agree with that. But what that, fit, what doesn't, that doesn't address is the access to education, which is closely related to economic uh, uh, disparity. So I well, would like to hear your comments on that. Well, I think uh, the, the issue you raise depends very much on the social system in which you function. There are definitely some social systems in which, uh, for example, you have access to health in a... I mean, no matter what, what are your resources, and some other systems where it's definitely access to, to health uh, is not the same, depending on your revenues. 
And uh, the same with schools. I mean, in a number of countries, schools is just free. And uh, you can get to, uh, and it's very important that public schools should not only be free, but also the quality, which means that teachers have to be respected and also well treated. Like they are two dimensions of the same thing, because of course, if you pay your teachers very poorly, probably the best teachers are going to go to a different system where they are better paid. So I think uh, this is very fundamental because uh, in the long run, this is, going to, this is going to be what is going to shape society. So I think these are really very key issues. And um, uh, typically, I mean, again, for, for um, concerning uh, health, for example, the, um, of course, in recent years, may, I don't know whether you have uh, been following this, but uh, one phenomenon which has appeared, which is uh, new in many countries, actually, some it's uh, worse than others, um, the uh, life expectancy has not been uh, increasing anymore. And even it's a very interesting study, which has been done by one of the Nobel Prize in Economy, which is the relation between the, uh, in the US, uh, the, the, the relation between, uh, in some specific region of U, uh, US, between the, really the vote for Trump and the fact that the ex life of his expectancy has been diminishing. So of course, uh, it, it means that people see around them that uh, the belief that things are getting better and better, actually it's not true. Very often, as you know, for life expectancy, it's not just that you get sick and then you are not treated well and then you die. Sometimes you help that by drinking too much or having not enough exercise. And it could also be personal uh, practice. You can improve your life expectancy having some kind of a better uh, agent in, the, in, the what you, in, in, your, in your life. But, but still, I think uh, this connection between the, the economic situation of people and the way really very basic things like when you die uh, becomes something which needs to be uh, looked at. And of course, there was the long time belief that this uh, increase in life expense will never be stopped. And now people, some people start to doubt about that because there are a number of countries where this is happening with very different social systems. For France, for example, the, for, for men, we are increasing by a month of life exp expectancy per year when we used to have six months. And for women in the recent years, we even had the decrease by one month, which was, uh, of course, they can be, all these things fluctuates, but something which was a very steady improvement uh, really uh, actually stopped. And <clears throat> France is not a perfect system, uh, health system, but still it's a very accessible system, reasonably, reasonably good quality. <coughs> so it shows that if, if you are in worse situation, that if really the health system is not very elaborate or not accessible to everybody, then you can expect that such a phenomenon is going to develop much more. And so from that point of view, it's true that one of the basic arguments for scientists to say, look, uh, the improvement which has happened in health, which definitely was a result of, uh, I mean, much better knowledge, but better quality of treatment. <clears throat> so it shows that um, we have to be very careful. If that was the only basis we could offer to people, as you said, uh, of uh, the importance and the value of science, uh, then uh, we are in trouble. Because in the sense, one of our main arguments is just falling. <coughs> yeah. Thank you for your suggestion of uh, advocating education for, to vaccinate against fake news. So uh, besides education, are we all educating the people regarding the criteria, the assumptions, the parameter used to measure fake news? For example, I have four marbles. Physically, I see four marbles. But on another level, another parameter used there are maybe thousands, millions of molecules of marbles, of photons or electrons. Just like uh, uh, physics, what you see is one set of law of physics. Quantum physics, another set of law of physics. So when you're educating people, you're vaccinating against fake news. Are you also educating the limitations of the parameters, of the criteria used, and when do they apply, and when do they no longer apply the parameters? And how do you differentiate when you should use them and when you should discard them when they are no longer usable, your parameters of education. Well, uh, as you know, I mean, to describe an uh, education system is something uh, very complicated because it has to do with, of course, the means which are made available. That is, uh, how many kids in a, in a class. Um, and you know, some countries still have uh, 
the, in the same building, uh, three classes during the day. And that's the case in South Africa, in some parts of South Africa, because they don't have enough classrooms and therefore the material conditions are not good. The other part is, of course, what is the quality of the training of teachers. In particular, one thing which uh, actually I mentioned yesterday is uh, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, probably one will have also to retrain people a lot. Uh, who is going to do that? How do you, all these people will be trained? So in a sense, uh, something which for me is a very, very important today is that the teachers have to be helped in being retrained regularly because a uh, number of other, uh, I mean, uh, Elements of uh, knowledge have uh, appeared and they should be comfortable with these elements of knowledge. You see, the, the worst situation of a teacher is that if he's uh, at a loss with a topic, because usually he doesn't teach it in the right way. And so I think, uh, so you need all these parameters to really qualify the, the quality. As you know, very important thing, I mean, in, personally, I, I mentioned it already, is the motivation of kids. So if kids feel in class that they're really challenged in a good way, that uh, what they are offered is also they realize that they are gaining something, I mean, in their agility, in their capacity, uh, it changes completely the, the relation in, in class. I mean, of course, a, a good classroom is a classroom where all kids may be competing within themselves, but still willing to share something. I must say that part of the good side uh, of the teachers I mentioned who didn't motivate me to do math, that he used the, the, the pupils who were comfortable with the topic to help others. And I think, I'm sure, it played a very important role in my solid understanding of mathematics, even if I was not interested. At least I knew the mathematics I was teaching, I was uh, learning very solidly. Uh, it didn't motivate me. So I think all these elements, you see, are very different. Some are mean money, some others mean just a different uh, setting, a different types of relation between people. And of course, depending on different societies, we'll have different approaches for this. So I think this is uh, one point I want to make. Now, to come to fake news, we are still in a process where the multiplication of, um, I mean, the deluge of information is still, I mean, you don't know where it's going to stop. I mean, uh, I see this in my, in my position. Of course, I get a lot of information coming from people, but uh, the daily load is almost beyond what I can read. So. Uh, what do I do? Of course, I delete some of it without just lo looking at the title. I'm not even talking about really garbage. I'm really talking about people who write to me to tell me something. But at some point, you, you need to absorb the information and take consequences. And so at some point, there will be some regulation. So it, it's not clear whether this explosion will continue or whether it will just stop at some point. And then, of course, depending on this, whether it continues to grow and then clearly becomes completely unmanageable, or maybe AI is going to help us to manage this, um, or uh, whether it's, uh, it stops at some point and then you have some kind of a settling, uh, this is not clear to me. I mean, because you know for the moment a huge amount of information that we receive on our mailboxes are just information you didn't wish to receive. It was just sent randomly by machines and uh, without choosing you uh, on completely general abstract uh, criteria, but uh, most of the time non-pertinent criteria. So I think uh, for, I mean, to, to deal with the question that you, 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 you propose, I think it's very important to, to know, we, we are in a period of things changing so quickly, you have to know whether it continues or it stops. And it's very difficult at this moment to, to know about that because uh, that's, um, Difficulty. Sorry, uh, I'm not talking about the education per se, training per se, or the fake news per se. I'm talking about the criteria. I think are we teaching the parameters, the criteria, the limitation of the criteria used in education in fake news? The limitation of the criteria which you add whether it's a fake news or new news. Well, uh, I don't know what is the situation for, for Singapore. I know the situation for France. For the moment, this topic is not touched at all in class. And because every teacher has a very specific uh, area that he or she should be teaching. And uh, this kind of a topic is basically absent from, from the teaching in school. And at some point, uh, you have to face that and really to, to really have uh, uh, pupils also exposed to discussion on this. For the moment, in France, just doesn't exist. So I think uh, 
for example, then if you imagine that you start to introduce some teaching about this, um, how would you do that? I mean, what, uh, what kind of uh, area you would choose? But because there are all kinds of news. There are news which are, I'm, I spoke mostly about news which are connected to science, but there are also news which are connected to very personal information, which is a completely different thing. Uh, you have news uh, about, uh, I mean, there could be many different topics uh, that can be covered. And probably the criteria you are mentioning will not be the same depending on the topic. And, but for the moment, uh, in France, it's just not touched. I don't know for Singapore, maybe you are more um, uh, connected society. So maybe you, you are already in schools dealing about that. I, I don't know. So I'm just ignorant. We have time for a very, very quick question. Now, I thank you, Professor, for your speech. I would like to ask with regards fake news to the rise, because fake news is being used by many politicians now, especially in Europe to win elections because there's a, people are very concerned about immigration, how they affect them culturally and personally. Like with the rise of populist politician like Matteo Salvini and Marine Le Pen and even in Germany, far-right politicians are rising and they use fake news successfully to win many local, regional and even possible the next European elections. So with them winning the elections, I don't think they will curb fake news. In fact, probably this is the reason why they win fake news. And people believing fake news, people who also choose to believe fake news. Oh. So what's your view towards them uh, using fake news to win the elections? Well, there are well maybe uh, three short points on this. The first one is, uh, of course, that there are uh, news media, newspapers in particular, which are now systematically having uh, really items where they just analyze a speech and show what is true, what is not true. This is several media have now that systematically. Uh, and uh, quite often it's, uh, I mean, the, what is said which is uh, fake is obvious. In some cases it's much more subtle. So you have to, to be careful. That's the first point. The second point is that, you know, some people have understood, and maybe it was the most visible in the US election, that you don't need to change the minds of the votes of uh, so many people to change the vote. Because the votes are typically, I mean, you have to win, you have to change two, two to five percent of the votes. And therefore, if you, because you have the information, you can target uh, through fake news or through a certain type of information, very specific group of people. And that's where having access to d personal data on people makes a big difference. Uh, then you can really start to be really efficient. And this is exactly what uh, has happened for the U.S. election. I mean, if you look at the districts that have been changed, uh, if you, for example, there is a very strong correlation in the number of uh, messages which were sent to people on these uh, districts compared to others, which meant they have been targeted at specific districts where things, uh, the vote could be changed. So this is the second uh, dimension, which is, uh, of course, uh, and of course it was the first time it was arriving at such a scale. Uh, which mean two things, that first the, the data were available, so maybe some people managed to get hold of the data, and then they knew how to use it. And, so they, and now for the more long term, I think uh, some, on the topics that you mentioned, um, for example, uh, on immigration, I mean, if you look at the, the figures and you look at them really with a sufficiently long historical perspective, you see that at, definitely at some point there were a number of people who wanted to come, but, uh, for example, this is not anymore the case. And uh, so, in a sense, the, if, you take a, if you provide long enough information, you can think that the, describing the situation as an invasion, for example, which is typical language, which is huge in this case, is just not true. So, because you, you can just look at the, at the figures and not just look at the very last uh, month, but really put it on a longer perspective. So, again... If, but then you need uh, really an effort to gather information on the longer term comparative to other situations so that you can actually have arguments to show that this rhetoric is actually pure rhetoric. It doesn't correspond to reality. So I think there are these three dimensions which concerning your question. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bourguignon. Thank you.